Hi, y'all. So today we're going to be laying the theoretical groundwork, so to speak, that we need to question the usefulness and the validity of this anarchy thematic that we've been working with for the past few weeks while studying the major theories of IR. With the emergence of constructivism, some IR scholars began to question whether the modern international system could really be characterized as anarchic in the realist and liberal senses of that term. And even constructivists who accept that the world is in a state of anarchy have frequently questioned whether centering the anarchy assumption as the basis for IR theorizing is the most helpful way to generate theories that explain the outcomes in international politics that we care about the most, like conflict, trade, alliance formation, humanitarian intervention, environmental action, etc. Scholars who question the anarchy thematic have employed constructivist approaches to highlight the power of international law and other forms of global governance to constrain state action even in a supposedly anarchic world. This lecture provides an exceedingly brief overview of those arguments. There's a lot out there. I've tried to distill it down to just what you need to know. So I'm going to start with a discussion of how international law works to both constrain state behavior and generate new social structures in the international system. Then, in a discussion of global governance more broadly, I'll encourage you to consider whether the international system is best described as anarchy, or perhaps hierarchy, or some other concept is a better fit. And I hope that we'll be able to continue that discussion during our session on Monday. So let's get into international law. First, we have to define what international law is. International law encompasses a massive body of legal and quasi-legal agreements, norms, and principles that govern state behavior. International law can take many forms. There are three general sources or categories of international law. The first is treaties and conventions. These are written agreements that states willingly sign and ratify and as such are obligated to follow. They're only binding on those states who have signed and ratified the particular treaty. Examples of, of this include the Charter of the United Nations, the UN Convention Against Torture, the Kyoto Protocol, the Chemical Weapons Convention, and thousands more agreements. Sec the second category of law is customary international law. These are written or unwritten rules that form part of the general international concept of justice. Historically, customary law has been primarily unwritten. However, as the decades have gone on, more customary law has been codified into written treaties and conventions. All states, and not just the parties to specific written agreements, are bound by customary international law. Some examples of customary international law are uh, the principle of non-refoulement, which means that states cannot return refugees to situations where they might be harmed. Like if a Syrian refugee arrives on the shores of Greece, Greece cannot deport that person back to Syria because there is a credible threat that that person could be killed in that um, war-torn environment. So that's customary international law regarding refugees. Uh, diplomatic immunity for visiting heads of state and visiting diplomats is also considered to be customary international law, as well as the humane treatment of POWs. There are two criteria that are necessary in order to establish that a given rule qualifies as customary international law. The first is state practice, or usus in uh, legal language. In order for a rule to become customary law, most states have to exhibit respect for and adherence to that rule in their existing practices. And by practices here, we mean through official statements and actions. Typically, the state practice that the international community has looked to to determine what constitutes customary law has been the practice of Western democratic states. So some argue that this imposes bias on what ends up being considered a customary international law, which I think is a valid point. But that's how things have historically gone. The second criteria is the legal nature of practice, which is called opinio juris. Opinio juris is the expressed opinions of states, individually or collectively, that their actions have a legal and not merely policy or political basis. So if a state explicitly frames an action that it's taking as legally necessary and not just politically expedient, then we can start to consider that that action might be regarded as necessary under customary international law, particularly the more states that do that, the more likely it is that we're going to start seeing this as legitimate international custom. Basically, customary international law is what states say it is, so long that there is so long as there is broad agreement across states. And again, the substate of, subset of states whose consensus is considered important here uh, is typically wealthy Western democracies. 
Perhaps the most important category of customary international law is jus cogens. Jus cogens is based on preemptory norms. In other words, it consists of legal principles that are so fundamental that they supersede all other instruments of international law. Jus cogens norms are non-derogable. This means that states cannot suspend the implementation of any of these norms at any time for any reason. Most norms that fall under use cogens prohibit the most atrocious acts that human beings can commit against one another. For example, use cogens norms prohibit war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, slavery, and torture. The third source of international law is what we call general principles of law. This category is a bit more nebulous and contestable and can overlap in some ways with customary international law. General principles of law are widely shared conceptions of the norms that should guide legal governance. These general principles are based on theories of natural law, which argue that laws are a reflection of the instinctual belief that some acts are right while other acts are wrong. We often look to domestic legal systems to determine what constitutes general principles of law at the international level. For example, most domestic courts will examine whether parties to a case acted in good faith, that is, that they acted with the intention to follow the law, or at least didn't intend to break the law. This practice has been elevated to the international level, where international courts will consider in their decisions whether the parties involved acted in good faith and whether, they, uh, and, and whether or not the um, judges in the case decide that the parties acted in good faith will impact the outcome of the judicial decision, ultimately. Another example of a general principle of law is that states must consent to law in order to be bound by it. With the exception of customary law, which is binding on all states regardless of written agreement, states must explicitly agree to follow a law through signing a treaty codifying that law in order for the law to be binding on them. Another example of a general principle of law is equity. The law must be applied equally to all parties who are subject to the law. No states can get preferential treatment by international adjudicatory bodies. Finally, there are two what we call subsidiary sources of international law. These sources are not considered to be law in and of themselves, but they may help prove the existence of particular international law when combined with evidence or of international custom or general principles of law. So the first subsidiary source is judicial decisions. Quite simply, these are the decisions written by judges on international courts when ruling on cases. There are dozens of international courts across the world with varying levels of jurisdiction and who focus on different types of cases. Examples of international courts include the International Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, the International Criminal Court, and the WTO appellate body. It's important to note that the principle of stare decisis, which means bound by precedent, does not, imply, does not apply in international courts. In other words, unlike in the US and other countries with common law legal systems, judges are not bound to consider the precedent set in past cases when considering the merits of the case that's in front of them. International judges base their decisions on the text of the law itself and not precedent from past cases that consider similar dilemmas. However, this doesn't mean that precedent isn't important in international law. International judges frequently reference past cases in uh, in order to inform and justify their, their legal reasoning in contemporary cases. It's just that unlike in common law domestic systems, uh, international judges aren't bound to rule according to precedent. In this way, the international system looks much more like civil law domestic systems. The second body of writing that we can consider to be a subsidiary source of international law is legal scholarship written by highly qualified international lawyers, judges, and academics. These people's reflections on the concepts and purposes surrounding specific instruments of law can help inform judicial decision making and provide fuller context for the interpretation of international law. So you read an article by Martha Finnamore and Stephen Toop today for today uh, that gets right at this question of what international law is. This article was written in response to another article in the same journal by Abbott et al that put forth three concepts or, or dimensions for evaluating the extent to which the rules governing relationships between international actors are legalized. So let's just quickly review Abbott et al's three dimensions so that we can be um, up to speed on what Finnamore and Tupa are arguing against here. 
The first dimension is obligation, which means that states are legally bound by rules or commitments and therefore subject to the general rules and procedures of international law. This refers to the extent to which laws are binding on states. The second dimension is precision. The rules are definite, unambiguously defining the conduct they require, authorize, or prescribe. International treaties vary widely in terms of the level of precision that they employ. Some treaties give states significant leeway in terms of the actions that states must or can take to comply with the treaty's terms, and other treaties include incredibly specific mandates that leave little to no room for interpretation. The third dimension is delegation. Delegation grants authority to third parties for the implementation of rules, including their uh, interpretation and application, dispute settlement, and, and possibly even future rulemaking. International courts are the most concrete example of delegation. For example, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, whose logo you see here, is charged with enforcing the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is the primary body of maritime international law. 167 states are signatories of this convention, and the tribunal is made up of a rotating set of 21 judges from different member states. Finnemore and Toop claim that the d these three dimensions proposed by Abbott et al. present an excessively limited view of international law's form and function. The authors argue that Abbott et al. aren't really describing the characteristics of legalization. Rather, they're describing a related but subsidiary phenomenon called legal bureau bureaucratization. Bureaucratization, that word is really hard to say. Legal bureaucratization means the institutionalization of law in public bureaucracies. In other words, it's how law becomes incorporated into formal institutions. But Finnemore and Toop highlight that law exists and works both inside and outside of formal institutions. Finnemore and Toop's quote unquote broader view of law emphasizes that obligation, in their view, does not emerge spontaneously from the mere existence of legal rules. Rather, these rules must be viewed as legitimate to the parties of the legal agreement in order to instill a sense of obligation. States don't feel obligated to comply with laws that they don't see as legitimate. So legitimacy forms this connection between formal obligation and behavioral outcomes. In order to be viewed as legitimate, there needs to be congruence between law and underlying social practice. Law must be constructed within existing and inherited traditions. Finnemore and Toop also take aim at Abbott et al.'s conceptualization of precision and delegation as necessary features of legalization. The authors point out that much of international law does not entail delegation to a third party enforcement body with binding powers. For example, as was the case when the authors wrote this piece and is still true today, most international law surrounding environmental protection and sustainability regulations does not delegate decision-making power to a third-party institution. These environmental law regimes depend on voluntary compliance and information sharing that helps member states put pressure on other states that aren't complying. This is also the case for much of the global body of human rights law. For example, the UN Human Rights Committee has no enforcement power, as decisions are not binding on states. Still, the committee hears hundreds of cases uh, every year, and its decisions can carry significant weight in galvanizing social and legal movements at both the domestic and international level that can pressure national governments to implement reforms. In a similar vein, the authors take issue with the argument that more precise treaty agreements are inherently more legalized or that precision is inherently a good thing. This, they cite evidence that states are typically more likely to change their behavior to align with the treaty's underlying goals if the treaty gives them more discretion to decide exactly how they're going to do that through domestic policy implementation. A critical point of Finnemore and Toop's argument is that international law's primary function lies, as in, lies in its generative and not its punitive powers. This is a very constructivist way of thinking. Through creating international law, actors learn new vocabularies and frames that they can use to think through collective problems at the international level. This provides a pathway to put new issues on the international agenda, even issues that aren't traditionally considered to be a priority for the most powerful states. Law gives us distinct sources of legitimacy to base our decisions on, and in doing so, it shifts the interests that states have to cooperate with one another. International law also gives domestic groups new language and evidence to push their governments to implement desired policy changes. In Finnemore and Toop's words, law working in the world constitutes relationships as much as it delim delimits acceptable behavior. <laughs>
Fenimore and Toop's analysis gets at this expansive continuum of legality from informal to more formal norms within international law. International law can be broken down into two very broad categories, hard law and soft law. Hard law includes legal obligations that are binding on the parties involved and can be legally enforced in a court. Hard law primarily includes written treaty obligations and international court rulings. So an example of this is the Geneva Conventions. That's a, a written treaty that's binding. Um, and the rulings of all of the regional human rights courts are also binding. So the European Court of Human Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and the African Court on Human and People's Rights. The other category is soft law. These can, soft law consists of agreements, principles, and declarations that are not legally binding. So an example of this is UN Human Rights Committee decisions and UN General Assembly resolutions. Those are not binding, states are not required to follow them. Now that we've discussed what international law is and what it does, let's move on to what is certainly a question of much debate. How is international law actually enforced? The whole premise of anarchy is that states are unconstrained by any sort of global governance structure. So how does law work at the international level? There are two dominant schools of thought on this that take what's called a top-down approach to theorizing enforcement. Top-down approaches focus on the role that international institutions themselves have in enforcing the law. So the first, uh, first approach here is called the enforcement approach to compliance. And this is rooted in rational choice and game theory. Enforcement, uh, proponents of the enforcement approach claim that states choose to defect from international agreements when confronted with an incentive structure in which the benefits exceed the costs of defection. Excuse me, the benefits of defection exceed the costs of defection. Let me just say that sentence again, I screwed that up. So the enforcement people think that states choose to defect from international agreements when confronted with an incentive structure in which the benefits of defection exceed the cost of defection. There we go. Therefore, non-compliance is best remedied by increasing the cost of defection through employing coercive strategies such as really intense monitoring of state practice or imposing sanctions on non-compliant states. The other dominant strain of thought that's still within this top-down approach is called the management approach to compliance. Proponents of this approach argue that states' main incentives for compliance are the realization of efficiency, interests, and norms. Because of these positive incentives for compliance provided by international regimes, noncompliance does not occur as often as those in the enforcement school claim. When noncompliance does occur, it's typically not the result of a deliberate decision to violate a treaty. It can instead be attributed to limitations on state capacity and ambiguous treaty language. So consequently, managerialists argue that IOs, or international relations, IO is the abbreviation, should invest resources in the areas of state capacity building, clarifying rule interpretation, and transparency as remedies for noncompliance. There are also what we call bottom-up approaches to theorizing the enforcement of international law. These approaches center the role of domestic actors, such as civil society organizations like NGOs, as well as lawyers and judges in national courts for enforcing international law. Some authors call these domestic actors compliance constituencies. And there are many ways in which domestic actors can enforce international law. I will just give you two very quick examples. First, domestic lawyers and judges can cite international court rulings in cases that are substantively similar to justify ruling in accordance with international precedent. And depending on the nature of the domestic case, this can make international legal principle enforceable at the domestic level. Second, domestic groups can gain support for social mobilization using information about state practices that have been published by international institutions. Remember that for a lot of international institutions, their primary job is data collection and publication. Domestic groups can use this information to pressure their governments to comply with international legal principles. So that's a very brief crash course on international law. Now we're going to shift focus a bit to, to focus on the more general topic of global governance, which includes international law, but also the various non-legal ways in which states can regulate the behavior of other states. The Barnett and Finnemore reading you did for today talks about the global governance role of international organizations, which can have legal and non-legal mandates. Barnett and Finnamore, as the title of their article indicates, demonstrate that IOs can be incredibly powerful 
and also, as they say, pathological in international relations. And this is a deeply constructivist argument that requires departure from the realist and liberal assumptions about how institutions work at the international level. So let's recap what the theories that we've been covering so far in this course tell us about the role of institutions in international relations and how, if all, they might be, um, these, these institutions might be exercising power over states and populations. So classical realism doesn't really theorize the role of international institutions, so we have to look to neorealism to get the realist viewpoint on these institutions. And in the eyes of neorealists, international institutions serve the interests of the strong states. That's their only function. So these institutions might therefore be detrimental to the weaker states. Or states might just choose not to take international institutions seriously and pursue their own interests outside of them. In liberal institutionalism, too, states are self-interested but they can only properly pursue those interests through cooperation. Institutions make cooperation easier through repeated interaction, locking in commitment, reducing transaction costs, and creating greater transparency. The emphasis here is on alleviating the worries of states that they will get cheated, meaning that they'll cooperate while the other party defects, resulting in a loss for the state. For constructivism, institutions can be understood more broadly. They have histories, are embedded in global power relations, and they can fill, fulfill an array of roles. A crucial difference from rationalist approaches is that in constructivism, institutions can develop their own identities and roles that are independent of those of the member states that make up these institutions. For the literature on, on norms and institutions that we've studied so far, international organizations have mainly been a force for good. The emphasis has been on positive norms, such as the abolishment of slavery, women's suffrage, or conventions against torture, or landmines, etc. This very much has to do with the liberal approach to international organizations, which is that cooperation inherently will lead to po progress, and cooperation is always a good thing, and that goes all the way back to Kant. When we limit our examples to these good norms, the problems faced by institutions is that of recalcitrant states that need to be socialized, such as those states who engage in various forms of modern day slavery, those who prohibit women from voting, or still use torture or landmines as methods of policing or war fighting. But if international organizations aren't always good, then that shifts the questions that we have to ask. And, and Barnett and Finnamore say no. International relations aren't all, international organizations aren't always a force for good. And the reason that prior theories don't discuss that is due to the limited way that they conceptualize power. Recall that realism focuses on power as an innate good, and neoliberal institutionalism focuses on welfare improving cooperation. Both liberal institutionalism and neoliberal institutionalism focus on welfare improving cooperation. And constructivism focuses on the normative aspect of power. So one thing that might be inadequate about these theoretical approaches to institutions then is their focus on a single variable or aspect of the situation. And Barnett and Finnamore point out the inadequacies of these approaches by turning to sociological approaches. And this, these sociological pro approaches are very much still within the realm of constructivism, it's just a bit of a different variant. Barnett and Finnamore argue that in contrast to the rationalist approaches, Sociological approaches focus explicitly on power. But don't rationalist IR theories talk about power? Haven't I been telling you that this whole course? Well, yes, of course they do, but not the type of power that Barnett and Finnamore are trying to push us to think about. So we might argue that neorealism focuses on power, right? For realism, it's only states that have power and institutions further the already existing power dynamics. And for liberal institutionalists and certain strands of constructivism, power is not as central of a concern. It's interests for liberals and ideas and norms for constructivists that primarily drive international politics. But other, and particularly certain strands of constructivist approaches, have tried to develop this broader understanding of power. And, and Barnett and Finnamore's work is in conversation with these approaches. Michael Barnett, by the way, got his political science PhD right here at the University of Minnesota. So according to this approach, there are two main ways of thinking about power. And the first is thinking through whether power is direct or diffuse. In other words, am I acting directly on you or is our relationship a mediated one? For instance, I might put my 
I might tell my dog to stop barking at everything that moves outside the window of our apartment, right? And I can put her in her crate as punishment if she doesn't stop barking. That's an example of me exercising direct power on my dog. Alternatively, I could ask my fiance to tell the dog to stop barking because she listens to him in a way that is, is much better than how she listens to me. So that would be a mediated or diffuse exercise of my power. In the approach utilized by Barnett and Finnamore, they're trying to make this point that international institutions exercise direct and diffuse power on states in ways that are not theorized by earlier approaches. The other main way of thinking about power is, is whether power is played out through in interactions or relations. Power through interactions implies that actors already exist prior to the power relationship. For instance, countries A and B already exist before country A tries to force country B to do something, like engage in a trade relation or concede a part of its territory, etc. Relation, on the other hand, means that we become what we are through these relations of power. For the example, uh, for example, you're the you're only a student in relation to the university. Without the university, you wouldn't be a student. Or you're only an American citizen in relation to the U.S. government. Without the U.S. government, you wouldn't be an American citizen. Taking this approach to power, Barnett and Finnamore argue that IOs can become autonomous sites of authority independent from the states who created them. They can do this because of power flowing from at least two sources. One is the legitimacy of the rational legal authority that they embody, and two is control over technical expertise and information. And these are very interrelated. International organizations can be considered to be bureaucracies. They're filled with experts in a particular subject area, and they create policy in accordance with their mandate. For example, the International Labor Organization creates policy on the international protection of workers' rights, like work, work safety standards and collective action rights. That's the only substantive area that the ILO works within, and the people who work in the ILO aren't politicians, they're experts on workers' rights. Every person within the bureaucracy has a specific role. And their position within the bureaucracy is based on their expertise and how they use that expertise to make rational decision, decisions about policy that will apply to all of the bureaucracy's constituents equally. In this way, bureaucracies are considered to be legitimate when they are comprised of experts in their given subject area and create consistent policy based on that expertise. This goes all the way back to Max Weber's definition of bureaucracy as having rational legal authority. Barnett and Finnamore think of IOs as bureaucracies as well. They, they take up Max Weber's um, approach here. This means that their power is connected in the impersonal, is their, they, this means that the, excuse me, the power of uh, IOs is connected to this impersonal expertise that they have. And Barnett and Finnamore point to three main areas where IOs as bureaucracies exercise power. The first is the power to classify. IOs might classify countries as developed or developing, or as democracies or non-democracies. They also might classify groups of people as farmers, laborers, or as refugees, asylum seekers, or internally displaced people. The classification of states will have consequences for their ability to borrow loans from the International Monetary Fund, for example, uh, under what conditions they can borrow money, what interest rates will be attached to those loans, and so on. Classifications might also have consequences for investment to a country. Foreign investors might think of a democracy as more transparent and reliable than a non-democracy for an investment. And labeling or classifying people will have consequences for their ability to access aid or subsidies or their ability to seek shelter in a different country and the kinds of protection that they might have there. The second bureaucratic power that IOs have is fixing meanings, which transforms these categories into policy areas. IOs diagnose and solve problems. For instance, uh, non-democracies are often asked by IOs to reform their judiciary and hold free, regular, and fair elections. Developing countries are asked to cut subsidies and reduce trade barriers. Farmers are asked to become more entrepreneurial, and refugees are asked for proof of persecution as well as proof of their innocence, that they're not party to the political conflict that they're fleeing from in any violent way. When presented with the authority of international organizations, these solutions might eclipse other possible ones with important consequences. For instance, insisting on enforcing early elections might increase tensions in countries that are transitioning from a civil war to a democratic government. 
Many people have also objected to the, um, the limited focus of the IMF's austerity measures and the speedy opening up of economies for, to free trade, noting that this actually contributes to sometimes greater unemployment and the creation of large wealth gaps, pushing the poor further into poverty. So fixing meanings is really important because once we assign meanings to certain categories and we assign certain solutions to certain problems, bureaucracies, because uh, policy gets entrenched and, and repeated in, um, and is consistent, because that's the goal of bureaucracies, is to constantly put out um, consistent policy doctrine, we can get caught in these, um, these patterns of assigning solutions to problems that don't actually fit the problem at hand and might actually, like the examples I just gave, exacerbate the problem. Lastly, IOs can exercise power through the diffusion of their expertise. IOs can think of their work internationally, or IOs do think of their work internationally and um, apply their work generally on the international level. They diagnose problems and propose solutions to a variety of contexts that member states could encounter. Thus, they promote and diffuse the same economic and political models of good or appropriate behavior in a variety of contexts where they may or may not fit. So you can probably see where I'm going here based on the Barnett and Finnemore, Finnemore article, but let's regroup before we get there. We can see that power can be understood broadly. That means beyond the material capacities of states and it's exercised in important ways by IOs. And IOs are effectively bureaucracies. They're organizations made up of civil servants, officials, bureaucrats, and they're trying to operate rather impersonally. And their authority is based on their expertise and a rational legal approach. All of these factors come, to, to come together to create the appearance of an office that is not political or is apolitical. In this view, an international organization is simply a group of experts that are trying to produce the best solution to a given policy problem. So what might be wrong with that? There's strong criticism of bureaucracies domestically, and I'm sure you've heard of or maybe share some of these criticisms, which include too much paperwork, lack of efficiency, trying to maintain their area of expertise and authority in a parochial or territorial way, lack of connection to the outside world, etc. And Barnett and Finnemore argue that most of these red flags apply to the case of IOs as well. And this leads to what they call pathologies, or dysfunctional behavior of an actor that arises out of the characteristics of that actor itself. In other words, the pathologies of IOs do not arise due to the IO's internal bureaucracy not functioning properly, but rather due to the attributes that make the IO a bureaucracy in the first place. Barnett and Finnemore categories five, categorize five pathologies that IOs are susceptible to. First is called the irrationality of rationalization. And this happens when the available procedures and tools become ends in and of themselves. For example, election promotion or peacekeeping forces. Elections are often promoted by IOs to facilitate as a step in the transition to democracy, even when elections might actually create further political tension and undermine the move to democracy, as I mentioned earlier. Similarly, peacekeeping forces are deployed to a number of inappropriate conflict settings either ones that are winding down and where they have an exacerbating effect, or conversely in highly militarized settings where peacekeeping forces are ineffective because they can only keep the peace and remain neutral, but might create the illusion of a safe haven that's not actually there. We're going to be talking a lot more about specific examples of both of those instances happening later in the course during the session on humanitarian intervention. The second pathology is called bureaucratic universalism. And here I want you to think about the same sort of examples. Elections are helpful to consolidate dem democratic transition in some countries, but they can be counterproductive in others if they're implemented too quickly after a conflict, for example. Peacekeepers have facilitated negotiations to end some conflicts as well as exacerbating others. The point is that these tools don't have the same effects or accomplish the same goals in all contexts. But this pathology of IOs is that they often assign the same solution to problems in wildly different contexts. The third pathology is normalizations of deviance. This pathology arises when exceptions originally made to the rules become the rule itself. This would be, for example, the case of the so-called repatriation culture developed by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Early on in the organization's history, the UNHCR did not prioritize the goal of repatriating refugees back to their home countries when that was possible. 
But over time, repatriation became a primary goal. Initially, that shift began with exceptions made in select cases to calm the fears of host states who were concerned about accepting large numbers of refugees. But repatriation eventually became a major policy priority for the UNHCR in all cases. The last two pathologies are almost the opposite of one another. Insulation means that experts might be unable to recognize the full impact of their policies or formulate alternatives as they are ensconced within these institutions where others have gone through similar training that they have to become experts. Basically, that bureaucracies keep recreating the same kinds of experts, so there's a tendency to get trapped in potentially outdated ways of thinking that aren't in tune with the way that the, the contemporary world is working. For instance, moving towards really free trade and complementing it with fiscal liberalization rather than questioning how that might make economies vulnerable in certain contexts. And the opposite of this insulation is cultural contestation when parts of the organization might adopt different approaches to the same problem. For instance, when the UNHCR field offices focus on immediate humanitarian needs of refugees and the head office focuses on a legal approach to moving refugees around. This might lead to confusion and inconsistency within the organization. So as you can see, IOs develop a lot of autonomous power and influence that doesn't necessarily line up with the interests of powerful states as realism and, and even liberalism to some extent would tell us. And, and unlike the liberal version where IOs are merely conduits for preference aggregation across member states that make cooperation easier, this particular constructivist approach to power shows us how IOs can amass independent power that they exercise in complicated ways, for better or for worse. So given all of this, can we really think of the international system as anarchy? The Barnett and Sick Inc. reading that you did for today talks about moving beyond the ter territorial trap to think about other loci of power in the international system beyond just state powers. When we think of power as socially constructed through interaction between both state and non-state actors, the theoretical primacy of the anarchy thematic might get a little bit questionable. We can see that there are social interactions between a wide range of actors that generate and exercise power and subjugate certain actors to the will of others. But does this fact negate the fundamental assumption of anarchy, which is that there's no central world governing force that can constrain state action? Given the rise of international institutions in recent decades, is the world anarchic or could it be characterized as hierarchic? Is it anarchic with some social hierarchies that can mitigate the effects of anarchy, as Anne Towns' piece seems to imply? Is it helpful to start from the assumption of anarchy when we're talking about the drivers that are important for determining an international interaction? Or is the anarchy thematic distracting at some point? I don't know. I would like you to all think about these questions and be ready to discuss them um, on Monday's session. OK, I'm going to stop there. Uh, Next step is going to be the midterm, believe it or not. I can't believe that we're already like halfway through this class, but the reality is that that's where we're at. So uh, I'll be handing out a study guide on Monday and some additional details about the uh, exam. And by handing out, I mean emailing to you. I still haven't shifted my language from like the in-person world to the virtual world that we're all living in now. Thank you, COVID. Uh, so more details about that are coming. I'm hoping to have the exam written by Monday so that I can get, give you a better sense of what's on it. Um, and I think that's all I need to tell you. Oh yeah, so just, uh, I just wanna reiterate, and this is in the syllabus, but we're gonna be using our full scheduled class time for the midterm. And remember, our class is usually supposed to start at nine and go till 11.30. We've just been starting at 10 because I've been doing these pre-recorded lectures for y'all. So the midterm is going to start. I'm going to open it in Canvas at 8.55. So be sure that you set your alarms and you're ready to go and you have a good breakfast. Okay, we will chat about that more on Monday and see you all later.